the cold winter evening of June 1896, Zimbabwean warriors, including women and children, waited silently for a signal from the chief to attack a European settlement. This marked the beginning of their fight for freedom. They camouflaged their bodies with dark ashes and wore black beads as part of their traditional war regalia. When the signal was given, they attacked the settlers. This was a national simultaneous attack by both the Debele and the Shona on the British settlers across Zimbabwe. The British had taken over ownership of the whole country and forced Zimbabweans to pay rent to live on Zimbabwean soil. They had gradually displaced them from their fatal land, looting their livestock in the process. At the end of the First Chimringa War, cumulatively the white settlers had looted 320,000 cattle from the Ndebele, equivalent to a whopping $160 million on today's market, and more than twice as much from the Shona, who were majority of the population. They took over other type of livestock, mineral reserves, and disrupted the booming economic trading activity, which was happening between the Zimbabweans and the Portuguese in Mozambique. This massive wall transfer basically created a peasant population, a poorer version of the black people in Zimbabwe, who were left with no choice but to work for the white settlers under harsh and tough conditions, so they could afford rent and food. The simultaneous attack by the Debele and the Shona caught the British settlers off guard. They described it as an incredibly well-laid plan, which was sudden and well-coordinated. It was the best well-kept secret between the Shona and the Debele. The two ethnic groups were divided because of their history together. Upon arrival in Zimbabwe, the British had exploited this friction. So how in the world did these two come together and create such a successful plan? Had the settlers underestimated the Shona people's fighting spirit? Were they secretly planning a resistance under the radar? On top of this, the British had finally conquered the Ndebele in the 1993 Matebele War, leaving them without a king. So how did they come together to ambush them? Do you know about the Debele Queen Lozike, the powerful senior queen who took leadership after Lobengula and rallied the Debele warriors into the First Chimringa War? To answer these questions, we are going to go way back to the early 1800s and build up a timeline of events which took place in Zimbabwe till the end of the First Chimringa War. This is part two of a four-part series on the history of Zimbabwe. So make sure you watch the first episode, the timeline of events which led to the first Chimringa War, to understand some of the topics which we will touch on. I'll be adding two more videos, so make sure you don't miss an episode by clicking the subscription button below and the notification bell. The Ndebele and the Shona in Zimbabwe. The Shona were the first inhabitants of Zimbabwe. By the 1800s, they had built a strong economy founded on the lifestyle of their ancestors, the Khoisan and the Bantu, who were skilled hunters, gatherers and farmers. They also engaged in a number of industrial activities, including iron mining, the manufacturing of basic tools such as spears, cloth production and cattle rearing. Local and international trade was a major part of the economy. They traded with the Portuguese in Mozambique. They also traded in their livestock for other items such as millet, groundnuts, cowpeas and bananas from Indonesia. Towards the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, the Shona lost part of their territory when the Ndebele came into the picture and settled in the southern region. The Ndebele were warriors who were descendants of the Zulu people in South Africa. Their founding father, King Muzidikazi Kumalo, was considered to be the second greatest Southern African military leader after the great and prominent King Shaka Zulu. Originally, he was a lieutenant in King Shaka's army. In 1823, he had a dispute with the king and rebelled against him. From 1823 to 1840, they are known to have settled and moved from Mozambique, the Transvaal, Zambia and Botswana. As they moved settlements, they would absorb members 
and livestock of other groups, eliminating all opposition and reorganizing captured territory to suit their order. In 1840, they finally settled in Zimbabwe, dividing the country into Mashona land occupied by the Shona and Matebele land occupied by the Debele. As per their tradition, tradition, the Debele would raid Shona livestock and grains. After witnessing the Debele raids, a European missionary Moffat brought all the poor Mashonas who were on the brink of extinction from the Matebele raids. It should be noted that other historians argue that these raids were not as excessive as they were portrayed by Europeans who used this to divide the two ethnic groups. The Ndebele had their own livestock-based economy and they received tribute from surrounding chiefs in the southern region of Africa. We will never know the severity of these raids, but it is clear that the Shona feared the Ndebele and their military prowess. As discussed in part one of this series, the British South Africa Company officially came into the picture under the Pioneer Column in 1890 with the Rad concession in hand to claim land in Zimbabwe. Because of reports from missionaries such as Robert Moffat and Charles Helm, when the British South Africa Company arrived in Zimbabwe, they were fully aware of the friction between the Shona and the Ndebele. They set out to exploit this friction by deliberately settling in Mashona land in a quest to manipulate and deceive. They avoided settling in Matebele land since this would immediately spark a war with the Ndebele who were now fully aware that they had been tricked to sign the Rad concession that gave away their land. On top of this, King Lobengula also had fierce military forces which made use of the Zulu short spear and shield. The Shona used the less effective longer throwing spear which you would throw and retreat. With the short spear, the Ndebele used a light shield to get in close range with the enemy, <coughs> stab them and immediately move <coughs> on to the next opponent. Upon arrival in Mashona land, the white settlers were welcomed by the Shona, who simply viewed them as traders who had come to settle temporarily. They likened them to the Portuguese, who had settled in Zimbabwe in the 16 and 1700s for a while and gradually moved on. In addition to this, the frequency of the Ndemele raids on the Shona decreased as King Lobengula deliberately avoided starting a war with the British South Africa Company, which had superior firepower. Because of this, in the short run, the Shona mistakenly perceived the white settlers as their allies. However, things took a turn when the Shona realized that the British were here to stay and were displacing them in their own country. Under the leadership of the British South Africa Company and Cecil John Rhodes, Leander Starr Jameson, a Scottish colonial politician, became the administrator of Mashona Land. Under his rule, the British did not show any respect towards the existing Shona government structures, culture and traditions. According to tradition, all land belonged to Mwari, meaning the Shona god, and therefore could neither be sold nor bought. The British ignored this and declared the Zimbabwean land as the property and asset of the British South Africa Company. Chiefs were advised they would retain their positions as leaders, but now under the British South Africa Company. They would also be allowed to go back to the ancestral land, but only as tenants, without any legal rights to it, and therefore subject to evictions at any point in time. Local leaders were stripped of their dignity and position in society. Elders and community leaders were disrespected, something which went against their traditions and values. To pave a way for more European settlers from Britain, they further angered locals through mass displacements which forced the Shona to move from fertile regions into arid and unproductive reserves. Fertile land was allocated to white people only. Dr. Felix Muchewa wrote in his book, The Struggle for Land in Zimbabwe. Through raids on the Shona, each member of the pioneer column was granted 3,000 acres or 1,320 hectares of free farm land. 
Zimbabweans had their own culture and governance systems, which were removed and criminalized by Europeans. For instance, no more life-supporting activities, such as hunting of wild animals for the purposes of feeding the family, were now outlawed and termed as poaching. This was simply absurd as the Shona were hunters. The British came to Zimbabwe empty-handed and had no economic base to colonize Zimbabwe, so they had to use dubious methods to get cattle and other livestock from the natives. Indigenous people were now expected to limit their domestic animals to populations determined by white settlers and enforced by the British South Africa Company's police, thus allowing them to freely raid livestock from black villages. Keeping more cattle than what was authorized by colonial settlers was punishable by the confiscation of the excess cattle and providing forced free labor for the settlers this, amongst other policies they implemented, disturbed the Shona from trading with the Portuguese. The hard tax was introduced by Rhodes in 1892, and blacks became tenants or renters on what was now British land. Failure to pay this tax had the heavy penalties. Collectors favored the method of payment in the form of cattle, goats, and sheep, or work for two months. All these items would go to the white settlers' wealth. They also accepted monetary payments. However, they made black people work for low wages. Hence, they were forced to give away all their livestock to keep up with the taxes. Oppressive methods of labor control in British mines and farms were implemented. The blacks would be beaten by shamboks. There were one or two officers in the body of police in each district. This rendered the Shona much more liable to labor and tax exactions. Police was spread across Mashona land and was begged by the native department created by the British South Africa Company. This system was similar to slavery. One thing is clear, the British settlers were wary of the Ndebele. And here is why. The Ndebele had a powerhouse in the strong military base, which was going to cause problems for them sooner or later. Remember the Debele were trained warriors and conquerors who had been trained under King Shaka Zulu's military. Do you honestly think they were going to sit around whilst the British invaded their home? Adding on to this, the Debele kingdom in Matebele land was still intact and was not under the British rule. This stopped the British from implementing a number of things. They could not explore Matebele land in search for the second El Dorado. This was an area which was reportedly rumored to be rich with gold reserves. They had not found it in Mashona land and assumed it was definitely in Matebele land. The Ndebele were settled en route to South Africa, so the settlers could not use this shorter route to travel and communicate with their peers in South Africa. The Ndebele Kingdom also overarched the region where the British wanted to build a railway line to Mafikeng at no cost. As long as the Ndebele Kingdom was alive, this was not possible. The Ndebele did not agree on the boundary which the British had placed to cut Mashona land from Matebele land. Jameson had declared the border to be at Umnyati and Shashi River. King Lobengula did not respect this version of the border. Because of the continuous raids on the other militarily inferior chiefdoms in the southern region of Africa, the Debele had thousands of cattle. The British were after these cattle so they could boost their own new economy in Zimbabwe. On top of this, Rhodes wanted to gain glory back home to have conquered and controlled the entire Zimbabwe for the British. Hence, he desperately desired to control Matebele land. The Ndebele raids on the Shona clashed with the white settlers' intentions for the Shona. The settlers needed them as laborers in their mines and industry, whilst the Ndebele considered Mashona land as a raiding ground. The British would be angered when the Ndebele raided the Shona, as the Shona would run away to secluded places, leaving the British mines and factories unattended. A war between the British South Africa Company and the Ndebele was inevitable. However, despite all of this, 
Rhodes and Jemison delayed starting a war to force the Debele into submission. This was done to prevent loss of confidence in Britain's future territory, Zimbabwe. On the other hand, King Lobengula restrained himself from beginning an outright war with the British South Africa Company because he knew that their weapons, including rifles and dynamite, were not a match for their traditional weapons. Lobengula's warriors were trained to attack in massed ranks. He reportedly could master 80,000 spearmen and 20,000 riflemen armed with Martini Henry rifles, which were modern arms at the time. However, poor training meant that these were not used effectively, and he would be going up against the British South Africa Company, which had more than 750 troops in their police force with an undetermined number of possible colonial volunteers and an additional 700 Tswana allies from Botswana. I could not find a reason why the Tswanas were assisting the British in fighting the Demele. However, this could be because they were being paid and this was part of the divide and conquer European strategy separating the same people to weaken them. An example of this is what happened in South Africa. And you said divided people are easy to rule. You said that's how yes. apartheid was able to exist. Can you expound on that? But one of the greatest greatest things that apartheid did within its world, it's, it's, it's so frustrating, is how powerful it was because it taught, or what it did was it, it sowed seeds of discontent among people who were the same. That was the power of apartheid. You must remember, black people are 90% of the population in South Africa. How do you govern 90%? How do you keep them oppressed? Well, what you do is you convince them that they are not one. Mm. You convince them that they are all different groups. Class. So you split them up. So you go, no, we did it tribally. So we went like, oh, it's Zulu, it's Swana, it's Beri, it's Songa. We separate the people. You live there, you live there, you live there, you live there. And then what you do is you separate people who are mixed now. So you go like, okay, yeah, I don't care if your parents are mixed. You're a new race. We're going to call you colored. Essentially, yeah, okay. that that is the, the, the best thing. We're all fighting in this world. And you, you start to realize, you go like, where is it coming from? Why is it happening? So you go like, oh no, you're holding us back. No. Separate the people so they would never communicate and rally up against the colonialists. Matters came to a head when Lobengula approved a raid to forcibly extract tribute from a Mashona chief in the district of the town of Fort Victoria, which led to a clash with the British South Africa Company. Before this, for an unknown reason, but possibly as a rebellion to the British, the Shona had cut half a kilometer of their telegraph wire under the headman Gomorrah. As a punishment, the settlers requested a payment in the form of cattle. The cattle used to fulfill this payment allegedly belonged to Lobengula and had been given to the chiefs under the Kuronzera system, meaning the borrowing and lending system. Lord Bengula protested against the Shona chief, who eventually took the cattle from the British and returned them to King Lobengula. This reminded the British South Africa Company of Lobengula's prominence. The last straw was when Chief Mere refused to pay tribute to Lobengula, who then sent an army to punish him, but with the instruction not to interfere with the white settlers. However, the attack brought the settlers' mining and agriculture activities to a standstill as their Shona labor had fled for safety. Jemison requested the Demele commanders to withdraw, but they did not react fast enough. He sent Captain Lendy to drive out the invaders, but instead he fired shots at the Demele army, killing Mgandai, a senior Demele army commander. This infuriated King Lobengula and things escalated into a war as the Debele retaliated and began fighting the British. I hope you enjoyed the video and found it informative. Don't forget to leave a like and stay tuned for part 2 on the continuation of the first world war.